Hello, and welcome to the podcast. You're here with Physique Development. <laughs> Today, we're going to continue right along with our new myth-busting series. In today's episode, we're going to give you our thoughts on the age-old question, am I too young or too old for strength training? And how young is too young? How old is too old? So the first thing we're going to talk about here is that first question, that am I too young for strength training? So I'm going to open up with a sort of a, a brief overview paragraph of kind of a, um, I guess an overview from the, the updated 2009 position stand from the National uh, Strength and Conditioning Association, the NSCA. Um, the first one was done in the 80s, I believe 1985. And then they did a follow-up, I believe in 1996 or 1998, maybe 1998. And then the 2009 one is just yet another update onto that. So I'd imagine there's another update coming soon to that position stand, but that's kind of where this information is coming from. And that, that position stand is the, the position stand on youth resistance training. Okay. So this is kind of a, uh, what I've taken from that. Okay. So the acceptance of resistance training in youth and adolescence is becoming more universal as young as 11 for girls and 13 for boys. We're working off maturation here. So girls mature faster than boys do uh, at that age, especially. And so a properly designed and supervised strength training program. And I, I want to say that again, because they said these words so many times in this position stand. And I, I think it's really important. And I think there's a reason they use this specific language, a properly designed and supervised strength training program has been shown to be relatively safe while enhancing muscular strength and power. It has also been shown to improve cardiovascular health, motor skills and coordination, resistance to injury and sport, psychosocial well-being, which is a huge, huge thing for kids, and develops exercise habits during childhood and adolescence, which I think is probably the most important thing if we're talking about exercise and health and fitness across, across a lifespan, right? So that's, that's sort of the open up or the opener here to kind of set the stage for, am I too young or are my kids too young for strength training? And the first question uh, I wanted to pose here, kind of open up the floor to you was, Sue, we'll start with you. When did you get started working out? And, you know, what did you do as a kid to stay active? Were there any influences in your life that participated maybe in weightlifting or strength training? Um, so what kind of got you started and when was that? Yeah, I started working out as far as lifting weights when I got into high school. So not only in gym did we have a specified weightlifting time, uh, but also within getting into more organized sports. Um, of course, we had practice in middle school, but in high school, there was a weight room. So for track, we went and we lifted weights. And for cheer, we didn't lift weights, but we did do some other activities. Uh, so I first got into it when I got into high school, but I was very active as a kid, a lot of bike riding, a lot of walking. And I also did swimming for 13 years. So I swam from when I was quite young. Um, and as I got older, obviously, until I was like 18, or so I was still swimming. And then I also got in a lot of activity again from sports. So I did field hockey in middle school. I also did, um, I was still doing swimming at that point. I did cheer. And then when I got in and I did track and when I got into high school, I did cheer and track and swimming. Um, and I also did basketball. And then I went over to doing some recreational basketball. So just a lot of sports and getting moving more than anything. Um, and even when I got into weightlifting, when it was in gym or for weightlifting for sports, it wasn't as organized as like now looking back and having more knowledge that I would have liked at that time, but it definitely opened the door and started to get me more familiar with what all was going on. When it comes to having um, influences that participated in strength training, I would say the influence wasn't necessarily people super close to me, but it was people that I admired, especially getting into high school and college of being the internet growing and growing and seeing other people getting into weightlifting or strength training. That was something that I very much so admired. I mean, I remember even within going in for track lifting that I really wanted to be able to lift the strongest. I definitely couldn't, but I wanted to be able to. And 
And I looked up when girls were able to put like the full 45 pound plate on the bar to squat. I was like, oh, one day I'm going to be able to do that. And so that's kind of how I started to get into working out. But I was a lot of sports and just a lot of running around as a kid, lots of bike riding. Yeah. Uh, for myself, it was it was more athletic based. So uh, I started in junior high with with football. We've talked about this a, a couple of different times where um, we we had a weight room at the junior high. It was basically a utility closet that they turned into this weight room that they packed in like 80. It felt like 80 kids in there. And we just kind of all shuffled around and and like, uh, yeah, tried to work out as a as a whole bench press squat, the very simplistic movements or the the main movements that we would perform. Um, Where was that gym? It was in the it was in the um, like the gym, the actual like basketball court. And then it was like in the literally a closet. You would be like towards the the end of where like the school was the the front of it. Yeah, across from the bleachers on the front side. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah Super yeah. tiny. Right. <laughs> Super tiny. I do remember. Uh, yeah. And so that was how I got into to weightlifting. And, and I've talked about this as well on my personal, uh, like my personal fitness journey podcast is that um, I was into weightlifting more so from like a bodybuilding standpoint. I was getting into it around 12, 13, 14 years old of getting into the muscle and develop or uh, muscular development magazines and those different aspects. But it was definitely more of a, a closet hobby. It wasn't something that I was very vocal about because again, at 13, I'm not even a hundred pounds probably. So it's not something that everyone around me from a social standpoint is like, he's into that or like it would make sense to people when they saw it. So, um, and then outside of it, even maybe before that being in seventh grade, it was maybe something where, um, like older, like friends, older brother would force us to try and bench press basically to make fun of us and tell us how weak we were. But outside of that, it wasn't much of of anything. And I will say one story that came to mind as Sue was talking about high school is that my freshman year, and this is when Austin was a a sophomore, um, Austin is already playing varsity football at this moment. And so my very first day, one of the first days or one of the earliest memories I have of this is that Austin was working out with all the seniors and I was familiar again we weren't friends early in in high school we were familiar with one another because of sports and those different factors but austin was already working out with the seniors and was playing varsity football so i thought he was like the coolest person ever and he was working out with a guy who i thought was also the coolest person ever and his name is travis darty i don't know if he would ever be listening to this podcast but if you are Doubtful, i hope you're still jack strong <laughs> one of the strongest humans ever, ever. like <laughs> oh my god um, he looked like an action figure as a as a senior in high school I would, I don't even know, like bench press wise, power clean, squat, every movement. He was so crazy strong and then looked like a bodybuilder. Um, It was like peeled to the bone and he had was carrying so much muscle density. It was wild. And so any supplement recommendations that that man gave to the team I was taking, which was cell tech. And I took a lot of cell tech and I can promise you, I still don't really look like Travis <laughs> to this day. <laughs> and definitely not at that moment, that cell tech did not push me over the edge of, of being the most jacked human ever. But, um, th- that's one of the earliest memories I have. Yeah. I once watched him. This was at, uh, the IU football camp. Mm-hmm. Some guy ripped his helmet off by the face mask, just ripped it off his head. And he proceeded to headbutt with no helmet the guy with a helmet on yeah and he knocked that guy down (laughs) and was just bleeding from his face and just all i remember is the coach is like you need to go sit down yeah you need to relax (laughs) and i was like dude like i think everyone was just like uh what's happening man like we're really nervous about this. That um, was my that was my first IU camp. Like that's what I was introduced with it, and I was like, "Oh my, this is what this is all about." There was a fight that year, like a full team oh, fight. Dude. That, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, "This is what this is going to be every year for the rest of my. This is going to be insane." <laughs> oh man, what a time! Um, pretty miserable too, to be honest, but um, pretty grueling, I would say. Uh, but anyways, so yeah, I, I'm the same as Alex in that way, where um, you know, it started athletically. Um, and you know, I, I, again, we've all kind of gone through this a little bit on our fitness journeys, but you haven't listened to those, then, um, you're kind of getting this for the first time, I guess. So, um, I started around 11, 12 years old, I would say, you know, probably closer to 12, I may, may have been 11, 
uh, maybe 12. But I started with my my older brother and, it, you know, obviously playing sports since I was five years old. Um, up to that point, you know, I'd definitely always been a physical kid and like been very, very active. Um, and, and that was really instilled early, early on. Um, and then from when I was 11 or 12, I started to live with my brother because my brother was is two and a half, almost three years older than I am. So he kind of had a leg up in terms of like his development and his um, ability to go through, you know, strength conditioning and ed be educated around the gym and that space and stuff. So um, he, we, we just lifted at like the, whatever YMCA was in, almost in Newburgh, but in Evansville, kind of right there by that Lowe's, if you remember yeah. where that was over there by, um, yeah, over by that Lowe's. And so we, we'd go there. Um, I'd spend most of my time shooting baskets and then he would be working out and then I'd kind of go in there and be like, okay, let's, yeah, I'll, I'll join. Let's lift, you know, let's work out. And then, and it, as I've said before, you know, he, he was great because he kind of, he was very, he's a rule follower, which is, I always make fun of him for it, but it was really great for me, uh, more or less bust his balls, not make fun, but, um, it was great for me because, you know, he, he never let me do something stupid under his supervision, you know, and that that's going back to like properly designed and supervised strength training programs. Like I, you know, really emphasized in that opening statement from that position stand is it's, it's really, really important that you at least have supervision. You want it to be properly designed, but like you need supervision when you're a kid, because that's when stupid stuff happens. Um, you know, that's when you try something stupid that you should never try. That's when you try to lift a weight you never ever could imagine lifting. Um, and something dumb happens, right? And so having him there was great. You know, he, he made me start with all body weight stuff and then getting into our athletic, you know, lifting career, like we've talked about with, um, with Josh and everything there, it's, you know, we had a really good induction, um, to working out and, and getting started and staying active as, as kids and stuff like that. Um, influence wise, you know, it was pretty much my brother, um, and being around that cause, and then going to the, I remember going to, to Bob's, you know, Bob's gym, our local gym. I talk like you guys are all where we're <laughs> all from, where we're from. Um, which why not, you know, but so Alex, where Alex and I grew up, there's, there's this local gym called Bob's gym. And, um, that's actually my first gym job. I worked there for five or six years and, um, I started to go there and play basketball and stuff. And I would like in between games, I would go in and like do one exercise, you know, like whether it's like, like a machine bench press or an arm curl or like some leg extensions. And then, cause you know, when you're playing pickup, you play a game and if you lose, the five who have been waiting now get to play and you have to take a game off and then you sort of reshoot to pick teams. And so during that wait time, I hated to wait and like sit there and watch other people play because I wanted to play. And so I would just go and like lift weights and stuff. And that was really kind of the first time I that had alongside my lifting with my brother was like the first time I'd really got into uh, into lifting weights. But um, yeah, good times Yeah, to look back on. For sure. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Uh, Alex, what are your, so let's go to you, let's go to you on this one. You know, I know we're obviously talking about, you know, people lifting and kids lifting and, and adolescents, I should say, not not necessarily kids, but we would categorize them as boys, you know, and or boys and girls in, in this scenario, right? So they're adolescent, they're young. Um, so what would what are your thoughts on adolescent kids getting into lifting, into strength training? And how would you how would you compare this to pre-adolescent kids depending more on play rather than structured workouts? You know, like what's what's that timeline for you and i guess how do you how do you differentiate between those two in terms of if you were to rec like if a parent came to you and asked you know like hey should my kid lift weights or should they maybe just play around more or what is that um yeah 
I, this is this is tough because I grew up and, and you grew up as well in terms of having such great guidance um, and the, the strength conditioning coach that was provided by the school that we were attending was so good. And so my viewpoint on it is just like, just listen to the coaches and just li listen to the supervisors that you have when you're in the gym, um, like lifting for the sports or, or what have you. And so I think it really comes down to the supervision that's available. And so if the individual um, that, it, like, let's say that a, a parent comes to me and they're wanting to know like when to have their kid start resistance training as a whole, if that parent has a better understanding of exercise execution and um, we can have a conversation of this is how I would recommend to structure things and make sure that you're tracking this and, and those different factors, um, I would feel more comfortable with a pre-adolescent um, child potentially resistance training at that moment if the guidance is is there in person. It's not going to be something that's going to be super viable via video and those different things. Do I think that it's possible? Sure. But I think that the hands-on experience for the individual who is going to be pre-adolescent or adolescent uh, child, I think is going to be uh, the move there. I would say that for the majority, um, you know, 90 plus percent maybe, I guess, would be a focal point on just the sports and, and having the coordination be challenged and potentially some of the, the body weight exercises like push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and uh, like body weight squats or lunges. I think that all of those are, are very um, helpful, especially from an athletic standpoint to uh, build maybe a little bit more muscle tissue, but even more so that the coordination aspect, like for kids that are... Um, kids in general, the coordination is going to be such a massive part of all the sports that they're going to be playing. The most coordinated kids are probably going to be the ones that are excelling the most. It's not going to be necessarily the most muscular kids because not really any of them are going to have a whole lot of muscle, but more so the coordination they're going to benefit from the most. So as they get into the, the adolescent, you know, we said 13. So 13 and above, I think at that point, we can start adding more resistance training with the best supervision possible. Um, and they're going to see great strides. Like I wish that for myself that I would have not allowed for my self-consciousness or the uh, fear of embarrassment to really drive my uh, like training and those different. I wish I would have just put myself out there when I was 13 and I was the, the weakest kid, at least in my eyes. And I viewed it as something that I I should be embarrassed about or I should have uh, like shied away from. And now as uh, I'm sitting here today, I would much have rather just taken the little bit of embarrassment, getting made fun of just a little bit more from my friends who were, we were all grilling each other the whole time anyway. So I don't know why that singular thing really stuck out to me the most, but um, I, I do wish that I would have just taken the plunge and taken the, the bumps in the road. And I think I would have gained so much you know, from that experience, even more than I did uh, how it all went down. So yeah, I think that uh, a big thing that I like to look at and a good example would be looking at food. So we've talked about just the environment we want to raise kids in and how we want them to think about food. This doesn't mean I'm going to have a child track macros when they are 10 years old. You can learn about food outside of tracking macros. So it's about the environment that I'm putting forth and teaching them about food, talking about it in a way that they are going to build a positive relationship with food. And I think it's the same thing with exercise as I want it to be building a positive relationship with exercise because we've all seen how people or even yourself can have a very negative relationship with exercise. And so my biggest thing as far as pre-adolescent and adolescent kids would just be building an environment and a conversation for them to understand why they're doing it and the benefits of doing it and finding what is going to be fun for them because, I mean, I know even between like our siblings, we are very different from our siblings. Um, and that's it, like something that I would have enjoyed at that time versus them enjoying at that time. I wouldn't want to squeeze someone into a box, but I would want to give them the option to be able to explore different boxes, so to speak, of what movement or what play looks like. And then I think it's also great if you are active yourself of being able to bring your kids along um, and have 
have them see you and use you as an influence. Um, and that's really important, especially like when we talk with clients, a lot of the feedback has been like, now I feel like I can raise my kids and teach them about this exercise and this food, and they're going to have a better experience than myself. And we've even talked about that between Alex and I of like, hey, when we have kids, they're going to be in a spot that they're going to learn about food. They're going to learn about exercise and what its place is and how to build that relationship. And so let's say you're a cyclist, like being able to, if your kid is too young to cycle, like getting the little tint that goes along with it, like bring them to enjoy the stuff. If you're in your gym lifting, then maybe you just bring your kid along and you have them do some some body weight squats. They want to be involved. A lot of the clients that I have that had home gyms, their kids wanted to be in there with them. And even just our friends who have very young kids, they want to be in there and they have like a play lifting set and they go in and they just want to do what their mom and dad is doing. So I think that it's really about building up the conversation and letting them learn about what they're doing. And then as they come into that adolescence of being able to structure what's going to be best, because I know that for myself, um, I've talked about like, I wish I had the coordination. Um, I wish I had the muscle. I wish I had the the body ability that I have now when I was in high school because I feel like I could be so much better at the sports that I did. And at that time, I didn't have the expert guidance like you guys did of having Josh and having someone who was very committed and very knowledgeable about what was going on. I had people that meant well but didn't have the background to really teach me how to utilize my body. And so I look at kids that might have not just been superstars starting off within sports, where it's like, I feel like I could have been a lot better in sports. And that also would have changed kind of my mentality, not only towards my body and its ability, but also just towards like, what do I want to do? What am I capable of? Because at that point, I just felt like I can't accomplish this. And this is how my body is. Um, so I think that there's definitely, um, um, it's very multifaceted and it goes into the environment that is being created and how things are being talked about as far as how it fits a situation um, and being able to get kids involved just within movement as a whole. Yeah, and I think that lends to, to what you are saying, Sue, towards our conversation last week around genetics, you know, mm -hmm. and how genetics you know, having like quote unquote bad genetics is, is a poor excuse because you can always improve and get better individually, right? And to take a look at maybe a snapshot of you in high school and all of those attributes you were just talking, like coordination, muscularity, strength, all of that stuff to now, you took a snapshot now, the, you know, both of those are different, of, you know, images I've seen, you know, very few, but like both of those are very different individuals you're looking at you know, probably physically, probably mentally, emotionally, all that stuff, obviously, right? And to say, it's like, to see a snapshot of you now, it's like, I bet you're pretty athletic and pretty good at sports in high school, <laughs> aren't you? You know, and then you're like, I'll show you a photo and I can get, you know, you can, <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy that genetics thing, right? Because as we were talking about in that episode, if you guys haven't listened to that, it's it's the previous episode uh, over genetics. And you know, in that episode, we talked a lot about how, you know, the, based off of your environment, based off your behavior and based off your actions and effort, it, there's, there's a pendulum you can start to swing in your favor as far as genetics go, right? Expressing certain genes that weren't expressed as a young child or um, maybe even a, a, as a younger adult, right? You can start to shift that for yourself and improve and, um, you know, almost obviously you as an individual, everyone, all of us as an individual have limitations to our genetics. But I, I think a lot of us leave a lot of the potential untapped mm -hmm. because we put ourselves in a box and we have this narrative about ourselves of like, you know, we have this like self-talk that it's like, oh, well, I'm not good at sports or I'm not good at weightlifting. I'm not a weightlifter. I'm not a person who does that. I don't watch my food. I don't watch like I'm not a person who like watches their food, you know, like mm -hmm. we all know people that like, and I'm not like talking down to that. It's just like, we all know people that ha have these, like almost like these mission statements about who they are and their personality. And like, 
these confines and exclusion criteria that make them who they are. And it's like, dude, it, the craziest thing about all of that is like literally at a drop of a hat or a snap of a finger, you can change who you are. You can wake up one morning. I mean, obviously this is contextual, but like you could wake up one morning, never be a weightlifter. And then all of a sudden one morning you're like, you walk by your apartment gym, you take a step inside, you start to lift weights, you catch the iron bug as we've all caught, you know? And you're like, oh shit, I'm a weightlifter now, you know? And it's just, it's a matter. So like all these matter of fact statements, I think it's really important to, to um, sort of take as a grain of salt. And like, may, maybe this is who the person you are now, but that doesn't mean you can't change who that, who that person is or, you know, improve upon or, or alter that in any way. So I wanted to uh, also say one of the coolest things for me, you know, just as a, as a person who does this for a living is it's like, I, it's a similar feeling I get when I, I watch um, those like coming home military videos where like the person, like the parent comes home. I cry every time, like every time when a parent, like, you know, when a parent surprises their, oh, yeah. their kids or their loved one or their dog, like that's the most emotional moment for me in my whole life. Like, yeah, I break down every time. And to me, it's like, it's not to the same like level of uh, <laughs> emotional severity, but it, it's, it, I get a, a very joyous and fulfilling feeling when I see uh, a younger child at the gym with their parent, like working hard and lifting weights and being curious and the parent teaching them and allowing them to just sort of explore and play within a structured confined you know continuum there right so it's like hey this is how you do this go do it like i'm gonna watch but like do it yourself and like work hard and this is what we do here and this is how it makes you feel afterwards and like all of that and it's there's a lot of people um especially at, at Dan's gym in, in Longmont, uh, the gym at Prospect, if you guys are Colorado people listening, um, I see there's a handful of parent-child relationships in that gym that ev every time I go, I see these, you know, I see these, these duos, these group, you know, these parent-child uh, ch groups and our duos. And it makes me so happy to see because it's just two, it's two people crushing it in the gym um, you know, and this is of all ages and some are, some are younger, some are like 12, you know, 11, 12 years old and some are, you know, 14, 15, but you can tell like with probably without that influence, they would, they wouldn't be there and they wouldn't probably have the same confidence they have in that space without that, that positive influence by their parent there. Um, and we all pick things up, right. As a kid, you definitely always want to be you're always like your North star is to be like your parents, you know, it's like, you know, if you're probably, if you're, I'm not, I'm just generalizing here, but if you're a girl, you kind of look up to your mom. If you're a boy, you kind of look up to your dad in a way of like sort of identifying with that. That's not mutually exclusive. You can definitely switch those two as well. Um, but that's how like my childhood was. I just like looked up to my parents and I was like, these are the coolest people I know. And like, I just want to be like them. And so, you know, you always see like, kids copying their parents and like trying to do things and it's like monkey see monkey do right mm -hmm. and it's like dude if you're lifting weights you're 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 doing positive things you're you're active you're not you know doing x y and z it's like your kids are going to follow that and they're going to be really excited about it um and they're ha they're going to have a, a structure to where if they want to pursue that in their own life or throughout their life they've been given a really good induction into mm -hmm. the world of what that is and the what you're supposed to do when you go there or you know seeking out positive physical things you know get even getting into like intramural sports as an adult like if you don't like weightlifting that's fine join a group fitness class go to crossfit join an intramural league like do anything that's active right and you make like a, a question we got on youtube yesterday you know it's like hey i'm kind of i love i love to bodybuild but I love to lifestyle bodybuild. I love to just the recreational part of, of lifting weights and, and improving my body, but I feel lonely because I do it at home. You know, how do I meet new people? And it's like, you just gotta, you gotta get yourself out there and, and try and seek out other individuals who may have a positive influence on that too. 
Um, and that's the same thing that you are doing with your kids in a, in a, you know, pretty intimate way, obviously a different duo relationship, but it's the same thing. Yeah. I love that. So let's move on. So that's adult, that's kids, um, youth strength training, youth resistance training. Um, so if you have young, if you have children, maybe this is applicable for you. If you're thinking about having children, uh, maybe this is applicable for you. And, you know, I, I think too, what I want to mention right before we move on to, um, older adults strength training is you, you're told so many things, right. As, as kids to kind of scare you away from doing something that your parents or your guardians or supervisors may find to be dangerous, right? And I, I wanted to have this episode because I was a part of, you know, I had a lot of positive influences, but I also had influences in my life when I was younger that, you know, it's the same people that were telling you that, oh, Coke stunts your growth. Um, you know, if you have a soda, it'll stunt your growth. And yeah. it's like, bro, that is so made Soda's up. Soda's a better use there. Yeah, I was about to be like, <laughs> crack, okay? <laughs> like so soda, right? Pop, uh, whatever your your term is in your region of the <laughs> of the world. Um, so Coca Cola, Pepsi. Of course, Coca Cola used to have cocaine in it, so I can't really um, say much to that. But anyways, we're we're getting off topic here. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of, of fear instilled into things that that super, you know, our, our parents or guardians used to our coaches or adults around us used to almost use as a tactic of of scaring you away from something that may or may not be negative or, or positive right i don't think drinking coca-cola as a kid is a great thing to do um but is it going to stunt your growth no that's made up um it will do other negative things for sure but stunt your growth probably not one of them to give it something energy to stunt its growth doesn't make sense to me but um as far as like weightlifting and strength training, this is also something I've I've heard grouped in with it's gonna stunt your growth. Right. And mm -hmm. I have a study pulled up um right here talking about um this is actually in that position stand. And essentially it reads, um, only three published studies have reported resistance training related injuries in children. One was a shoulder strain that resolved within a week, uh, a shoulder strain that resulted in one missed training session, and a nonspecific anterior thigh pain that resolved itself within five minutes of rest, <laughs> right? Which we all know is like, I'm s this burned. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's probably that. Um, but like, it's as long as it's supervised and as long as it's, it's structured and you trust, like Alex was saying, you trust that person that they have the best, in, like they're paying attention, they have the best interest of your child and your adolescent kid in mind. Like it's not gonna, no more than jumping off a playground set would add any other danger to, I remember as a kid, I used to jump off the, what, what's the highest point I could jump off of? And I would just jump and land straight on my, you know, just straight down. Mm -hmm. And it was like, that was, that's that's gonna stop my growth. I mean, that's why I'm stunted anyways. <laughs> like that, maybe that's gonna stop my growth more than weightlifting would for sure. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like nip that myth in the bud a little bit. If you are a parent, um, but just don't, that's not true necessarily. And there's a lot more nuance to it. And I hope this, this first part of this episode sort of open dries up to it. Yeah. And the last thing I want to say on that subject, just in regards to younger girls, um, I think it, I mean, as I mentioned, it does depend on the environment that you build. And I know I have a lot of clients that are still trying to unlearn things that they picked up from their parent, aren't we all? Trying to unlearn certain things things that they picked up. And a lot of it comes from diet culture or just dieting in general. And so I have clients that'll say like, I still have to get past this because like when I was a young, young girl, my mom would make comments of like a moment on the lips forever on the hips or like you ate that now you need to go exercise. So as far as like differences for young girls, just as I talked about in episode 67, the first episode of this myth busting, as well as in episode 64, the episode I did with Charlotte, I wish that I got into lifting sooner because I talk about it showed me so much that I was capable of. And I think that if young females can get into that, 
that can be so beneficial to show them their strength and their body is so much more than fitting a certain size or looking a certain way. And they get to decide what that means to them. And so I think it is powerful for women to be able to get into the gym and to bring younger girls into the gym as well, um, just to be able to have that mentality shift and to see that capability and also to break down that threshold from episode 67 where strength training isn't only for men. And that starts from a young age of like being told like, oh no, the men are going to go lift, you're going to do this. So I think that it's really, really important to usher girls into the weight weight room and to get them lifting and to teach them about what it can mean because just like Alex and Austin where I was scared to go into the gym and I didn't really venture into the gym by myself to like go and lift until I was a senior in high school um, and then into college a lot of it was because I had no idea what to do and I didn't want to be embarrassed and if I would have just gotten a little bit of guidance earlier on that would have really helped with me being able to go and do what I wanted to instead of being held back by all of these things that have been told to me. So just wanted to say that one last piece, but we'll go on and move into, am I too old for strength training? Yeah. And the answer is no, (laughs) as you'd imagine it would be on this podcast. Um, But the answer is no, right? Your ability to build muscle at the same rate as someone who's younger than you uh, actually may be reduced, right? That's a reality. And I had a conversation with someone in their 60s uh, on the 4th of July about this same subject because he actually asked me, um, he actually asked me like, hey, I have this the, uh, ongoing argument with my brother who's around my age, you know, in his 60s that, that you know, I'm not going to build any more muscle at my age, right? And he really, really wanted, I could tell the way he positioned this statement, he really wanted me to be on his side on this. And I just wasn't. You know, I was just like, dude, to be honest, like, I, you know, there's a lot of questions to you. Like, when's the last time you actually lifted a weight? Um, did you used to lift weights? Did, you know, were you more muscular as a, as a younger man? Like all of those questions, you know, and, and I just gave him the lowdown of all the other benefits that also come from it. Like if you're zoning in on purely muscle gain of the benefits that strength training can give you, then you're really missing the, you're missing the forest through the trees here in a big way. And so there's indisputable evidence of the benefit of of resistance training, especially for older adults. And I wrote a lot about this. I did an extensive amount of research for for uh, my book, Science of Strength Training, uh, about older adults and and getting into, yeah, yeah, hold it up. Here we go. Science of Strength Training. There you go. It's on Amazon. Um, So resistance training is by far the most effective standalone exercise strategy for counteracting age-related loss of muscle mass, strength, and power. Um, The retention of these these aid and prevention of loss of physical function and loss of independence as you age, right? And we all have people in our lives who are older who have lost the the muscle mass, the strength, and the power they once had, which 100% plays into their loss of physical function, right? Their loss of independence as they start to age alongside mental health and neurodegenerative benefits of reducing things like Alzheimer's disease and improving cognitive function and memory function, right? All of those things that we we see really degrade in, in our <clears throat> older generations, um, you know, are, are depending on, you know, your age, your, your parents, your grandparents. Um, I was very fortunate enough to, to know my great grandparents. They were alive till I was about 12 years old, um, which I know is very rare and, and I'm very grateful for that. And But you could see, you know, looking back on that, you know, we can see whether it's in our parents, grandparents, or great grandparents, you can see that the 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 degradation that comes from just not being physically active, not seeking out strength training, not seeking out resistance, right? Not not whether you know physically, especially not seeking out resistance. Um, So that's something there that is is very very important to know. And that's kind of that opening statement, just like we did on the the first segment um, of being too young. So that's that's my sort of overview of of are you too old? And the answer is no. And if if you're purely looking at strength training as a means to like it only just builds muscle, you're missing the forest through the trees, right? It it is so much more than that. And that sort of opens us up to to my first question here that I'm going to pose to Alex. 
Um, it is summertime. And with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. Alex, what is the most life experienced individual uh, you've worked with one-on-one? -on -one? And that's my kosher way of saying age there. Um, and what, are you, what considerations are you making to their programming, if, if so? Speaking of, of great grandparents, I was fortunate to have one of my great grandparents live until I was 18 or 19. Yeah. Um, maybe, yeah, 18 or 19. She was 97 years old. I, my, I think that's correct. My mom listens to every episode and I get her, um, review angel. Yes. Uh, fact check. This. <laughs> I get her review every Monday evening of <laughs> things that we said that was, that were funny, giving me grief for moments that I cussed those different things Yeah, yeah. <laughs> every Monday evening. And so, um, she'll let me Hello, know angel. if 97 is correct. And I will let you, let you know if that's the case. She was actually the, the individual who I saw the, like, she kept up with resistance training very lightly um, up until the time that she passed away. She was very much so into supplementation. She was actually the individual who really introduced me to to supplements. Um, she was, yeah, she was awesome. Like anyway, creatine? I don't know if she was taking creatine, but <laughs> she only believed in she only believed in vitamin shop alkali alkan alkanalized water. Mm -hmm. um, so she only drank vitamin shop water, and she brought it like when we'd have dinner at my grandparents, she'd bring the uh, vitamin shop water. She would not drink the the tap water at my my grandparents' house. Um, Wonder she, where you got it. She from. was a goober. She was a goober, and she was awesome. But Alex also does not like tap water. <laughs> I yeah, I do not like tap water. It's probably from her. Um, but the oldest. And individual that I have worked with or the most life experience individual that I've worked with was mid sixties. And so some of the considerations that I have, uh, that I would utilize in the program design for that individual is watching them through their movement, um, speaking to their ailments and those different factors. So a lot of video, um, is, is utilized in this scenario and seeing how they move through, uh, just simply hip hinging, going into a squat. What's the mobility that they have there? What are some things that we're trying to work through? Or, or is there anything like arthritis or anything of that nature presented and then navigating towards that? Because right now or in that time frame, really what I'm trying to accomplish, at least when I'm thinking back to the, the referenced, uh, client that we're speaking to it was a lot about coordination and ensuring that we are doing the best from a bone density standpoint, making sure that utilizing the training is not necessarily to add muscle density or, or to create a hypertrophy benefit. The, this individual that I'm speaking to is not going to be adding this massive bolus of, of muscle tissue, but more so focusing on the coordination, the um the neurological benefit of, of the movement patterns and those different aspects. So it's going to be considerably less volume and, and working through, um, and, and working to strengthen some of these smaller details, the, the, uh, tendons and ligaments and, and being able to work through the best range of motion that they could possibly do. Um, so that would be the initial thoughts. Yeah. And I think an important thing here is not just looking at like what age someone is, but just how able they are. Because I know Alex had a client that was around 55, who's extremely in great shape, mm -hmm. um, Maria. And she just, yeah. she reached the best shape that she ever has at 50. And she is in the gym like an animal. So yeah. it does depend not just on a blanket of, okay, when someone's 50 and older, this is how you have to treat them. It does depend on where they're coming to you from. Like Alex said, what those ailments are, what their mobility ability is. So that's all really going to matter because for that other client, you didn't have to scale back volume. She was all for it. Yeah. I've got a couple of clients who are in their mid to late fifties right now. And if I was to tell any of them that we were not going to like, uh, squat or do any of the movements that they love uh, because of their age, they would <laughs> They would probably drive to my home and <laughs> not be very nice. They'd be yeah. very upset. And I mean, Shannon Sharp is out here after it's a hip true. replacement bention, like it's nobody's business. So he's I, made from a different cloth. Yeah, he's, 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 he's he a different is, breed. I will say, he's his genetics people. are very good. Oh, dear. But he, <laughs> he is of an older age and still just getting after it. So I know for myself, I have definitely had a lot of clients, um, not saying 30 is old, but just saying as far as age range, from 30 to mid 50s. And it does depend on their 
mobility more than anything and how able they are because I have some that are achy breaky and some that are good to go and they could be at the high end or the low end of that range. So it's really looking at the individual and being able to see what do they need from this program right now. And some of it is just, I need to be able to go and play with my grandchildren. And some of it's, I want to be as strong as shit and pick up some heavy weight. And so it's really tailoring it towards what that person really Really needs um, because I know that um, getting into like my parents when I first started personal training I was training them in person and my dad was a D1 swimmer he was an athlete his whole life but with that he did a lot of upper body training and didn't do a ton of lower body training and when he wanted to get in and to lift I was like we're really focusing on some lower body stuff and we were doing hip thrusts and he was like why are we doing hip thrusts like I'm not trying to grow my glutes and I was like it's not necessarily to just grow your glutes or to get you a big old booty it's it's because we need to look at how able you are as you age. My dad's an extremely active, per- my parents are extremely active people as far as like they're running around all of the time. My dad loves to swim still to this day. They go on bike rides, they go on walks, they're all over the place. And um, it's he, if he was to, as you mentioned earlier, not be able to take care of himself, that would be the hugest detriment to him. And so I talked about like the reason we're focusing on your glutes is for your pelvic stability as you age. It's also to help your lower back and your knees as you age. And we need certain muscles in place to be able to move. And so as you age, it does get to a place where you can lose muscle mass and bone density. And if you aren't proactive or you aren't working on certain things, then that could really inhibit your ability to walk, to play, to stand, to do a lot of these activities that you want to do. And so being able to look at, okay, I know my dad through and through. I know what he wants to do. He wants to be able to run around like he's in high school doing a million different things. He tried to lift like a 10-ton fridge for my sister the other day. He wants to be able to do these things. And that starts with making sure his body can handle that and be in a spot that he is able to do that. So he's not trying to look like a bodybuilder or anything. He's trying to look comfortable or feel comfortable in his clothes, like the number that he looks down at and be active. And so taking all of that into consideration and building out what's going to allow him to do that. Is he going to spend an hour and a half in the gym lifting? Probably not. Will he spend 30, 45 minutes getting in there and doing other activity? Yes. So how can we make a program that is going to be best suited for him to live the life that he wants to? Because that at the end is really how I look at health is I want to be able to live the life that I want to and my health not hold me back. And so when I see that in other individuals, I am combing through the plan with a fine tooth comb to think, all right, what needs to be in place so this person can really feel their best and continue to do what they want to do with their life and not be held back by an age or just a health issue. Well said. And that that honestly uh, leads us into our closing here uh, on this episode really, really well. Um, so when it comes to to getting older, adults, Uh, to exercise or engage in physical activity, we need to consider the fact that most older adults are not meeting the recommended requirements to reap the benefits of uh, that physical activity or exercise, right? So that on average is, is very true statement. And we all have people in our lives that we can, we can sort of see and witness, and we've all come across and and cross paths with individuals um, who, who are older or or later in their life, who would fit within that realm of like, ah, man, like if you just if you just did this a couple times a week, I, I know you'd feel so much better um, and be able to not have your health be a limiting factor in your life, um, or at least give yourself an opportunity for your health not to to be a limitation. Right? Sometimes we're out of control with that. You know, we don't we don't always have the say. Right? Some of us are more fortunate than others when it comes to that. But um, with with all that in mind, I did want to bring up a, a 2020 study here um, called, uh, or they the title of the study is called pragmatic exercise recommendations for older adults, the case for emphasizing resistance training, right? And in this paper, the researchers 
basically make the compelling case for strength training being a pragmatic solution for maximizing health benefits for older adults. Because up to this point, the really, really the only thing that, you know, and I, I, again, I did a lot of research for the book uh, on this subject and read a, read a lot of papers, read a lot, a lot of stuff about it. And the most common recommendations a lot of times have to do with um, strictly doing aerobic exercise um, or like stretching and, and things like that. Um, and as we, we know and learn more about strength training, um, strength training does a really good job at, at aiding in the positive increase of things like mobility and your ability to, to move, uh, and be limber and, um, to be more agile and be able to take more of everyday life, uh, as it comes. And it also does a great job at creating positive aerobic adaptations, right? And so one of the things that these researchers made the case for was what is the, right? So, so time typically, or, or the energy, the amount of energy an older adult has to dedicate towards something that's physically active is is more limited right it's like okay i don't i only have this much time or this much energy each week to sort of give to this and so we have to start to make some some really informed decisions of like what's the best bank for our buck here like where are we going to get uh brain uh positive brain adaptations neurological adaptations muscle coordination adaptations strength and muscle adaptations adaptations where um, bone health will be restored or at least maintained um mood uh, anxiety, depression rates will will go down with this activity, especially when used in conjunction with uh, aerobic activities too, right? So I'm not saying like don't do aerobic activity as an older adult, but if you're going to choose one thing, it's like, hey, I'm just going to do one thing. I can't do all the things. I'm just going to do one thing. Then strength training is that thing that I would highly, highly encourage for you to consider, or just some form of resistance training in general, right? So. Uh, I, I want to quote this paper um, uh, here because over the next, they basically go on to say like over the next 40 years, right? The next 40 years, the number of adults over 65 years of age will more than double in the United States from 46 million to 98 million. And in this context, the, the importance of habitual exercise as it relates to healthy aging cannot be overstated. And I, I mean, if there's a statement that I fully agree with, it's that. Right, like we got to get people on board, mm-hmm. or just introduced to this uh, to this activity, or the 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 concept of activity and physical exertion in general, because all of the benefits, right? And and adding to that, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that lifelong exercise can delay the onset of um, at least forty known chronic conditions and diseases. Right, so I my closing question to you guys here is if you knew that there was an activity that you could perform a few times a week that would do that that would uh, would help delay the onset of at least 40 chronic conditions and diseases would you do it and it's like i hope your answer is some form of yes (laughs) you know um i hope it's some form of yes so if you're if you're an adult looking to get into strength training or get into resistance training or get into some form of physical activity and you're listening to this and you're like, I'm just looking for a sign or some motivation or a kick in the ass to do it. I hope this episode did that for you. And I hope that it did it uh, as well in in a form of encouraging, if you have kids, encouraging them as you get into it or as you stay in it, to encourage your children to, to be around it at least. Um, and you know, if if they aren't drawn to it, allow them the opportunity to see you do it and then uh, be patient and see if they're, they become interested, you know, cause I think there'll be a day where I think everyone hits an age where it goes from like, no, I just want to play outside with my friends to no, I'm actually pretty interested in doing this. I'm, I'm, you know, there's a, there's, I think it's a different age for everybody. It's a different time in everyone's life, every kid's life. But I definitely remember there was a time where I no longer wanted, 
I was no longer like truly drawn to going outside and playing with friends in the neighborhood. And I was a lot more drawn to going to the gym with my brother or going to the gym by myself to shoot baskets or something. Like, I don't know when that age was, but there definitely was an age for me. So um, if your kids are around that age, try to introduce them, be a positive influence if you can. And um, yeah, that's how I wanted to close this episode. Do you guys have any closing statements here? No, just consider this myth. Busted. <laughs> Busted. I'll get them in on it one of these days. <laughs> I think it's better that we don't get it. Yeah. So. <laughs>